Hey everybody, welcome to our broadcast today. My name is Evan Evans, film composer. And uh, to my left here is Dallas Crane. Hey, how are you guys doing? And we got Steven Stratvert. Hey, everybody. And Kyle Juhas. Hello, guys. And today we're going to talk about scoring. When in the pretext of the Academy Awards, we're going to talk about the Academy Award winning, or the Academy Award nominated scores. So we have uh, this year, um, if Beale Street could talk by uh, Nicholas Brittel, Isle of Dogs by Alexander Desplat, uh, Black Panther by, anybody know how to pronounce that name? Uh, Ludwig Gorin? Gorgonson? Or? Very good. Very Gorgonson. good. Gorgonson. I apologize. Uh, very good. <laughs> Mary Poppins, Mark Shaman. Nordic country. And yes. uh, <laughs> Black K Klansman uh, by, uh, whoops, remind me again, Dallas? Terrence Blanchard. Terrence Blanchard, thank you. So, uh, yeah, I've been listening to these scores a lot lately, and um, I think one of them that was very interesting, but also very interesting for the fact that Alexander Desplat's not going to make it to the Academy Awards, was uh, Isle of Dogs. Oh, I love that one. Yeah. Yes. yes. A cool story. I haven't seen the film, uh, but uh, as I understand it, a boy loses his uh, dog, and it goes to an island... A Japanese boy loses his dog. It goes to an island where, for, for whatever reason, all the dogs speak English. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he goes there, uh, the dogs can't understand a word of what the boy says, which is really funny because it's the opposite of, of what we really <laughs> tend to have. And then um, he's trying to search for his lost dog. And these do uh, dogs sort of have a disease, and they're relegated to the island because of that disease it's sort of like a prison island in a way. Kind of a trash island. Yeah, and it's a trash island. And because um, it's like this prison for the dogs in a way, uh, I think that the score, it's very relenting. It's like got this, you know, taikos and this Japanese uh, drumming and everything. And the fact that the dogs speak English sort of makes it seem like it's a massive fish out of water for the all the dogs. And then the, the, the relentless... Japanese score then becomes kind of ironically funny because oh, yes. you know because yeah. it's like these dogs it's almost like uh, was it Tenement, Tenement Square or something when Tiananmen. they played yeah Tiananmen Square when they played like the music for the dictator or whatever to to get them to come out they played the same song over and over and over it was like a oh. torture right. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because yeah. the, the way you say that the, the music is the is the straight man for the uh, the comedy and the, the dogs are the, the kind of funny heroes and then the music's the straight man to play off against it. Yeah. But yeah, the, the music it's like one tempo all the way through. It's oh, yes. it's it, to me it feels like like the ceremonial music. Yes. From from Japan, mm. you know, you get the taikos and they just you know keep going and then there's sections where you have the low voices right. that are chanting which are awesome and then. What I think is really interesting is almost like a jazz moment where it's like the Pitts bass and the baritone saxophone. And it's just like, dum, 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 dum. Right. Just over and over. Uh, yeah. It's great. It's The it's unrelenting great. aspect. And also the fact, like you mentioned, that there's like sort of a traditional uh, music uh, element to it. It's almost making farce of, you know like what do 100 year old traditions kind of do like as a social statement. I think it's pretty brilliant of the director, you know, to be able to pull all that together. Well, you know, uh, Wes Anderson did it, and he's known for these highly symmetrical, you know, almost... It's it's like every shot is placed as if it were some dollhouse you're looking right. into, you know, right. some kind of scene. And I don't know, I think the music was either joining up with that or making fun of that, because that's exactly what the music sounds like. It's perfectly symmetrical, it's balanced. Yes. It's just... Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. And it just kind of... If that's what Wes Anderson were to sound like. Right, I know. Kind of I'd be sport. curious to see some interviews with Wes about how he feels about this movie in his whole repertoire. Because I don't think he really did that with the score in any of his other movies where it was that just strict. Like, uh, was it Budapest Hotel? Yeah. It was the same pairing, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was a lot more free. A little more free and open. I feel like uh, like Fantastic Mr. Fox, for example, was a little more like that. It was a little more kind of symmetrical. It was very kind of by you know almost like almost like an actual kind of mathematical you know formula for it. You know that's right. kind of how he's very very perfect. 
Um, but it, it, I noticed it, that probably had some more similarities, I think, than any other, other soundtracks than for what I could hear from Isle of Dogs, where it was uh, almost like this, you know, very set droning, like, rhythmic pattern, kind of with this dramatic music, but also this, like, lends itself to this very subtle humor. And, I, like, I just, I think it's just Wes Anderson. I think really, because I think he does have a lot of input into the actual compositions, probably not from a standpoint of, like, an actual composer, but just as he, I think he's just very close to that process. You can kind of right. get it, you know. Yeah, so. uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox to me feels like a movie that was made like decades ago, but I just missed out on all this time. You know, <laughs> yeah, it's like Jesus and the Giant Peach or yes. something yeah. as a movie. You know, it's like a classic movie, but it's just so young. And then Isle of Dogs to me feels like it's the same thing. Well, what yeah. did you think about that score, uh, Isle of Dogs, Steve? Yeah, it was very like, it, it's kind of like, I hadn't I haven't heard any other scores like it. It just kind of... I don't know if it takes itself too seriously. It's kind of like, it's just kind of fun, uh, and it's very rhythmic. And uh, yeah, I think it definitely stands out in that regard. Yeah. That's you know, it has like no ambition to it. You know, it, it's not, it's it's groundbreaking, but it's not trying to push the medium that it's in. You yeah. know, it kind of fills it up and just sits there. It's funny you say that because like I was listening to the mastered soundtrack. And I was like, what the hell? It was like, it was almost like uh, muddy. Mm. Mm. And I was like, wow, I mean, maybe he just wanted this to be just like, you know, you put a taiko drum out there and a couple instruments, a couple microphones, and don't don't touch anything. You, know? yeah, right. <laughs> you see, get what you get, get you know? Right. But, uh, yeah, well, yeah, what did you think, uh, Kyle? Uh, I, honestly, I'm like almost the same thing. I feel like Wes Anderson, when he, whether it's developing a film or if he's working with a composer, you can kind of... It's almost like he's kind of doing a satire, but in, in, in its own regard, like he doesn't want to be so upfront about it. Like he kind of really wants to hold it back. It's very reserved. Um, and I think it's, you can see that in his scenes. Uh, you can see that a lot where he tries to, uh, when he has a lot of kids in his movies, he kind of tries to like convey that, not childhood innocence, but that awkwardness of being a certain age and being a kid and being thrust into a situation that you're not comfortable with. And uh, I think he really excels at that. And then I feel like I also I think the music and the soundtrack just plays along with that. Like I haven't seen the film myself. I've really wanted to. I just kind of missed out on it because uh, I'm, I'm a big a big fan of his work. But um, yeah, those those Japanese voices really are kind of unsettling. Yeah, but in a funny way. I exactly. It's like you know the basis of all humor is a man with problems. That's what humor That's is. What you is. know. So the the music is kind of like yelling at you for some way you don't know why exactly you just want to figure out like stop yelling at me you, you you get that sense of like it's very dramatic but like why is this so dramatic yeah, in yeah. some regard you're like why does this have to be so like exactly why am I getting yelled at you know like it, it does yeah. it really it really has like the first track you know you, you hear that really those low chantings and um, I think it just also kind of represents uh, I think you try to try to get some like Japanese culture in there even maybe like uh, maybe like from like a previous era where it was very um, very like almost kind of like his films very fit everything's very symmetrical yeah, I think that's kind of a part of that probably even like pre-westernized yeah too. exactly exactly so the, the Barry Sachs is interesting but it's not played like you would expect a baritone right. sax right it's very reserved not a lot of vibrato just very kinda, controlled yes oh yeah that Barry Sachs stuff was really really cool so great yeah. it's a great sound I think it, it wasn't be. a bass sax no I don't think so. It wasn't okay. quite so husky. Quite so burly. Yeah. Yeah. But it's an interesting choice to have, like, the pizzicato bass, the sax, yeah. you know. it's That's the European, like, yeah, it's, sense they it's, brought. It's weird. It, it gives me some Nintendo vibes, you know, where it's, like, four <laughs> instruments just kind of, you know, and they can't play all this crazy stuff, and so it's, they're just stuck in a box kind of looping around. But that's probably uh, an association I made myself more than anything. Yeah. Cool. I noticed uh, Jayla says hello. Hello, Jayla. Hello, Jayla. Welcome to the discussion. Jonathan Parham, Martin Wasinius. Thanks. Nice to see you guys. So, um, yeah, what do you guys uh, think? Anything other thoughts on that one? I think that was my personal favorite. Um, and you'll you'll see why later on. As yeah, we cool. talk about these other scores, but... It's it's the most unique. Let's hold off on our favorite to the end. Well, now we know. Spoiler. <laughs> we'll see if I change my mind. Now, you guys the new that. people who tune in, they won't know that. 
<laughs> spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. He loves to spoil the spoilers. <laughs> but good, yeah, yeah. At the end of this, let's all like mention which one we yeah. think you know ought to ought to win and why. Nice. If you can. Very nice. It can be just a personal feeling, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. if you have a reason why, even better. I'll throw some money down. <laughs> Next, let's talk about uh, Black Kick Clansmen. Is that how you pronounce it? Black, <laughs> Black Kick Clansmen. Black Kick Clansmen. So, uh, so yeah, I, I watched this film on the way back from Miami recently on the plane. So I'm not I'm not entirely sure if they may have cut out some scenes, but they did say that they didn't edit the movie you know, at the beginning of the, of the oh, thing. Okay. But I'm okay. not sure I believe it, although... So I took pretty matter-of-factly some of the cuts that happened, which were really abrupt sometimes. Hmm. I think I was hoping that might have been like the authorship of Spike Lee, okay. but it could have been could have been the fact that it was on an airplane. Right. Yeah, the, the austerity of yeah. film when you realize you're watching film. Yeah. The director makes it really obvious. Yeah. But, uh, however, uh, so I did think the film was trying to be something. I don't know if you guys got a chance to see it. No, I haven't seen it. No. Okay, it felt like it was trying to be something, as opposed to just being something. And I, I suppose you know that's the truth. You know, Spike Lee wanted to make like this, this kind of seventies throwback black exploitation kind of movie, in a way that could actually make it somehow relevant to the current discussion about you know the racism going on still here in America. Yeah, kind of. Uh... Like, t- you know, take it and, and reshape it and modernize it. Yeah, see, but now, yeah, I don't know that he really did that. That's the only thing. But I think, in my opinion, the score was one of the things that didn't help it combine it and make it something new it's not a great or score. fresh. Um, it was kind of your ye old, tired, mellow detective noir mm-hmm. jazz score which hey was cool to see jazz mixed with a black exploitation right. film you know mm-hmm. that it's not typical you know you, you know you try to go to like the uh, 70s disco style or something you know so that was kind <laughs> of neat but it wasn't fresh it was just no. this has been done oh quite quite over and over yeah. so you got that same impression yeah it's, it's disappointing because Terrence Blanchard is one of the top two in my opinion top two like jazz who became film composers the, the other of course is Wynton Marsalis right. he doesn't do nearly enough films let me just interject Mark Isham also yeah <laughs> yeah but these guys are like New Orleans born and bred yeah you know kinds of guys so t- to to hear Terrence Blanchard do this kind of score um, it I know he does a lot of scores, but it just sounded like he didn't really know a lot about orchestration. It, it was like mm-hmm. he took a jazz group and then kind of just glued certain mm-hmm. things that one jazz person would do onto like the string section. Uh-huh. You know, there's this like string string horn octave sound that was just all the way through the score, and to me, it just sounded like a, an anime sample. You know, just kind of this. <laughs> it was a thick sound and it was sterile. And there wasn't mm-hmm. a lot of texture in the score. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very minimal. I noticed that. One yeah. Thing was he would add things. If that... you see the film, that does work in its favor. Okay. That minimal quality. That minimal okay. Because it's trying to be almost like a resurgence of the black exploitation film, but in a cinema verite way. Which by the end of the movie, and if you haven't seen it, you know it's unfortunately we're going to spoil it now, but. Um, it's not much of a spoiler because I think it was the talking point of what made the movie probably be nominated for Academy Awards in so many categories was at the end of the film they start to show real footage they, it starts mm. to suddenly the issues that you just watched they th- which was set in like 1980 mm-hmm. they fast forward like 40 years and it's the same people they're just older now you know uh, David Duke you yeah. know and um, and the same issues are totally current events you know happening in our time so i think if you play that up as like a big scored movie uh then it would have been hard to get there i I, I, I was gonna say i I think a lot of as well with these scores in general uh i think one of the things especially this one um they tried to almost do like almost like a tongue-in-cheek kind of like these issues you're watching this from you know you realize from the past and you know it's 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 serious, but these issues are still going on today. I think he was trying to almost convey like, isn't it kind of funny that we're still having these topics and these discussions? 
and seeing all this racism kind of come back into this country at 2019 isn't isn't it 2018 you know when it was released isn't, isn't it yeah. i felt like the soundtrack almost kind of had a little bit of that too to it i just feel like it very subtle very tongue-in-cheek but still had just this feeling of like kind of like almost uh it's hard to hard to describe i kind of got like a sense like I, sometimes when i was watching you know listening to it i felt like it was almost like music from an old like an old military kind of recruitment video maybe for like world war ii or something like that oh, okay. it was kind of like this almost this triumphant kind of thing but it just it just or like propaganda yeah maybe, maybe a little bit of propaganda shit i can't i wasn't sure if i should use that word or not if i should kind of do, but <laughs> it, it, it did it, it kind of had that feeling to it but i i don't know if it was well i think that's what spike lee's like he's all of his films yeah are. Kind of, like yeah, i don't I know, know if he was trying to make it as exaggerated or and just keep it very in the background so you yeah. can kind of you know subconsciously pick up on it yeah. um but I, I got that feeling i do i kind of got that very tongue-in-cheek like this is a very serious <laughs> thing but isn't it kind of funny that this is still a very serious thing we yeah have, we i have i heard it, yeah. that that high string pizzicato was like to me sounded like you know supermarket music mm-hmm. he had that mm-hmm. a ton of it going throughout what, what when you say minimalism it, mm-hmm. it felt minimalistic but it felt it felt like ink minimalism like he had not written a lot mm-hmm. for the musicians ah. to play but it wasn't okay. you know there could have been texture that would have not made it any larger than it was right you know mm-hmm. so it's very still and sterile and i think too minimal and not minimal in the the right ways the, the other thing i noticed he had He's a very good melodist, yes. right? Coming from that jazz background, but there, there's so many points where yes. the melody was just so overdone. Mm-hmm. It was just this big long, you know. He has these weird shapes that he yeah. does, but he didn't support it anywhere. So it's just this weird kind of thing. When you're watching the movie, yeah, those melodies do get in the way, and hmm. it almost felt like it could have been a like, what do they mean? Um, a library drop-in type track movie. Uh, you know, it's like why did we? hire this guy to score this if it's just going to be used like this you know yeah like he's dropping his and then he's like well you you have to tie in the themes you know you got to hire a custom composer because you got to tie in the theme and so there's just too much too much theme i think you know later we'll talk about if beale street could talk and i think that that score did that's you know did something really really great with jazz um that that unfortunately i think um black Klansman did not yeah, it's I, actually I, there were a few tracks I liked. Uh, Ron's Search was one I noted because he actually had a drum groove to it, so it was funky and it was in Terrence's element, and it sounded great. He had these horns. It didn't sound like he was playing because his trumpet sounds very identifiable. So he actually had, you know, this horn section playing in the back, and it wasn't him. And then the main theme with the electric guitar was really nice because one of Terrence's um, identifiable qualities of his scoring is to have this like nice glowing melodic sound and then this weird texture kind of this bitonal thing drifting through yeah and yeah. that came in through the, the the main theme really well and it didn't really come out in any of the other tracks mm-hmm. so he kind of almost like he he took out what made what makes film scores him he, mm-hmm. he you know he uh Mm-hmm. sanitized it I guess Jonathan mentions that uh, it's based on a true character so that's interesting mm-hmm. yeah. I remember hearing that from the I think from the previews trailer they said that was based on a true story so yeah mm. based on real characters and such so that's very cool um, yeah. so that makes it a little bit more worthy it, yeah <laughs> I like what Dallas mentioned though it, it, it did it had it was kind of sterile it was in a lot of ways it just I, I feel like it's one of those soundtracks where they're, they, the ideas were there and almost like listen just like an, an, you know, an album by a band in general where it's there are certain ideas and certain songs you really like but they don't really capitalize on certain things they kind of just like we'll just leave it like that and I, I got kind of the feeling with this I don't know if it was mm-hmm. a very intentional thing or they just kind of overlooked certain some parts some overconfidence yeah maybe. possibly overconfidence as well yeah well, we can just keep that I think that sounds great but there were there was like ideas and it was like I wish you would have like even like I, I heard that like a lot of the you know um, actual electric guitar in some of those parts it, it did. It's, it was like, why didn't you maybe use it maybe a little earlier, or maybe keep kind of bring it up in certain aspects, or because I felt like it was more of a, like a standout idea, for, you know, yeah, with, with layered in those it's, tracks. It was a really cool idea. Yeah, just not enough of it. Exactly. Did you exactly. get a chance to listen to that score, Stephen? So, um, that was one of the ones I didn't really. I okay. just heard a little speck of it, but cool. I didn't. What do you think? Uh, you know, could have been done different. I mean, I watched the movie. So yeah, but yeah, that maybe makes it a little easier. Better but, idea. But do you, what? What do you think could have made it better? I I just think some more. I hate to say this, but a little more technique. Some of the, like I said, the string horn octave writing 
um, just didn't have any kind of narrative feeling to me. So if he had done a little more, to to just art music and not enough narrative. It, it didn't. So it it wasn't interesting from an art perspective and also from a narrative perspective. So it didn't really work in either vein. Mm -hmm. So if he had done something something a little more. Um, bold narratively that would have worked okay. or if he had replaced that those string horn octaves with something just a little more interesting is it a case of just a composer just having an uninspired few months maybe I, I think so because he has really great work and his music is very profound and rich mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if he was just uh, banking too much maybe on the story or you know I'm not sure yeah. Yeah. Also, sometimes you can get the that kind of it had that watered down effect quality to it. You can get that watered down effect sometimes when the director is toning you down. Maybe maybe Terrence came in with something really swinging and live and bright and he can do it. You know. Yeah. And uh, maybe Spice said, "Hey, you know, this is another one of those ones where we just want to like tone it all down and be in the background." And so he did his best to kind of. Uh, you know, bring it down, and uh, sometimes that can be a bit of a mechanical crafted process, and you, you, you pull all the inspiration out of it. Yeah. Now, Baby Driver was a film that perhaps had similar construction. I would say that had so. a really yeah. nice soundtrack, even though it was all licensed. Even even just the textures that they used, you know, they had the drum at one moment. It was like drum and bass, just kind of going through and pounding. So it had that minimalist feel, but it was still musically interesting it just always depends on your actual execution I feel like it does it just you can have a very minimal approach but as long as you yeah, as long as you just execute those ideas properly and in the right context I think it just it, it, you can go from a great soundtrack to kind of a eh, kind of a blah soundtrack kind of kind of bland yeah. um, so. now the next one on our list is somebody is composed by somebody that uh, I've thought of as practically a god since uh, um, city slickers Mm. Ah, okay, nice. And I was so happy to meet him, and basically within the first month of when I moved to L.A. when I was 17 years old, and to me it was like meeting just one of the best composers in the industry, and that was Mark Shaman, and uh, he's done the score to Mary Poppins mm. Returns. Uh, yes. And uh, I have to say, like, this, the writing in the score is just... Solid. It's incredible. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. If if we could give the score to anybody for just technical, sheer technical technical prowess, it would be that Mary Poppins. Yeah, absolutely. He he outwrote everyone this year. I think you could possibly you could probably say. I don't know mm -hmm. if the Mary Poppins French vehicle, you know, is what's going to get him the Academy Award here this year. Um, but I think this is a real strong, viable contender for sure. I thought the writing was just just phenomenal. There's more notes in a minute than there are probably in Black at Klansman's entire score. <laughs> yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's so energetic, and it has you know, all those wonderful harmonies that you expect from this kind of music, and he's taken the original material and expanded it and added new material, and the balance is great. It's even better than La La Land. I think La La Land had a messy quality to it. Yeah, sloppy. I think, yeah, a little sloppy. And I think that's part of the narrative idea. Yes. But also, you know, just comparing... This score is done by a professional who knows how to do this kind of stuff, and you just can't fake that. It's true. You, you really just have to know how to do it. And in this case, it's it played well. I love the harmonies. My favorite song was Turning Turtle. I yeah. It was yeah, I think, yeah. Just silly and fun, and it moved all over the place. The lyrics were good. Oh man, the songs were incredible. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. When you approach a, like a Disney project like that, especially one with that kind of, um, I mean, the originals obviously hail is one of the most you know popular sort of films from that from that era, and it is. It's it's there's such a caliber of um, of talent that is just expected of you. I think when you when you approach like a project like that and you're a composer, um, you really do have to kind of set your you, the, the bar has been already been set. You kind of have to like you you really can't go below that. You do have to have extremely rich harmonies extremely beautiful orchestration very well produced you know these are things that are just expected of it 
mm-hmm. you know, and, it, and it's one of those things where if it doesn't have it, it's not going to have that Disney-esque experience to mm-hmm. it. It's just not. You're not yeah, you really it. had to hire a real composer, yes. you know, somebody yes. who can write with pencil and yes. paper and... You know, uh, I don't think there was any way you were going to get away with that on Mary Poppins Returns. No, exactly. it's like it's like you can exactly. paint you can paint some clay white, but it's not going to be porcelain, and you've got to right. really have a master to, right. to work with the porcelain. So I think they did a great job hiring Mark Shaman to do that. Absolutely, but I I think that was probably one of the most interesting kind of musical type scores for a while. If I remember right, um, the Last Showman was very bare and dry bones, whereas this one is very um, filled out. Right, yeah. Was it to me like the what is the greatest showman? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the greatest showman in La La Land were kind of similar in that they were just doing sort of pop arrangements. Yeah, it was like the layman's musical where they didn't have necessarily great talent, and so the the orchestra kind of was focused around that. And right, just making a chill, kind of approachable vibe, yeah. and relatable. It reminds they, me of like that old show on TV called uh, what was it called? Uh, Fame. You know, that people just had different talents and they had, you know, dancers or singers or whatever. Right. And it's just, just sort of like a talent show, a talent show. That's different than, you know, Mary Poppins Returns where you've got to write a real score and, you know, real masterful. I mean, if you and if you listen to that score, it's extremely well orchestrated. You can hear everything from top to bottom. Super clear balance. Mark Shaman is is probably one of the underrated masters of our time. You could definitely learn that from Mary Poppins Returns. Yeah. Now, what, what do you guys think? Was was the score groundbreaking at all? Because I think it was very well done. But I don't know right. if I would say groundbreaking. I and mean, that was one of those things where it's like, does it does it have to be? You know, it's kind of like, does it have to be ground? Because you're, 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 it's almost kind of what we mentioned before in previous podcasts where it's that experience, you're going for that experience, you're going for that actual, you know, musicality of it. And I think for those types of soundtracks, it's, it's, you really have to have a great bridge between those because people are expecting these huge harmonies, these huge sing-alongs, you know, they, they want to hear that when it comes, you know, have things really just kind of come down into a, a very nice dynamic range. And people kind of, you know, I feel like if you try to go a little bit outside of that, they're going to p- pick up on that immediately. Even someone who's not maybe accustomed to Mary Poppins, but has seen a bunch of Disney films from their childhood, is going to be like, this oh, yeah. Doesn't this sounds off in some way, shape, or form. And I don't know if I'd call it groundbreaking, because you do have to kind of pander a little bit, because people are expecting this is from a movie right. from 50, 60 years ago. Right, yeah. So how outside of the box can we go with this? But, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that, but I do think, again, I'm not... This isn't, Discredited for being a well-written, well-produced piece at all. Yeah. It's you know, mm-hmm. it, it's definitely a standout in the Disney era. You know, like a Michael Giacchino score has a specific flavor to it, but this one is very historically informed and accurate yes. and energetic and, and filled out. And there's, you can tell there's no holding back because of some you know technical limitation, right? Or, right. You know, lack of knowledge or time or anything like that what do you think Steve mm-hmm. I mean I'm personally uh, this is just my opinion but I don't I think Emily Blunt I think she was the main character she was Mary Poppins I don't think she captured the same um, authenticity as um, the, the Julie original Andrew. Julia yeah there was, was a Andrews, huge somebody, yeah. <laughs> there, yeah Julia Andrews or one of them. I'm, I'm yeah. just blanking out but I don't from what I yeah what I remember she just didn't Capture that vibrancy, yeah. I think, in her voice, and that's probably because she wasn't. She's not a trained. She's not a trained Broadway. Trained Broadway singer. singer. Yeah. Right. No. So yeah, it would have been nice to that. to have someone. Yeah, but however, I must say that uh, the nomination is for the score. The score, <laughs> not for yeah. the songs. But no, yeah. I mean, you bring up a good point about some of the maybe you know problems that the movie itself has mm-hmm. as an entire vehicle with all the talent involved and everything. It's maybe it has a few a few things that it maybe fell short of, but it, it as uh, I didn't see it, mm-hmm. um, but I heard that it had uh, Dick Van Dyke comes back. Oh you know, wow! So oh wow! Cool. Yeah, I, I, I like how you mentioned a vibrancy because with all these scores, I get the sense that in two thousand eighteen, the sound was brightness of glimmer, yeah. you know, kind of that upper register, you know, balance everything higher up, not a lot of lows. It, mm-hmm. Everything was very bright, that shimmery. Too. Yeah, yeah. That that to me sounds like the 2018 sound. You mm-hmm. get that, of you know, with Black Klansman and the, the high pizzicatos, that kind of supermarket yeah. vibe. With Mary Poppins, obviously, very shimmery and glowy. Um, with Isle of Dogs as well. Yeah, and absolutely. Then, you know, with the others. Is, is absolutely. It. Looks like we've got also uh, Mark Street here. Hey, Mark, how you doing? Hey, Thanks Mark. for joining today. 
And uh, earlier, uh, Jonathan Parnum said, uh, he always likes Terrence Blanchard. You have to respect him in this day and age to have a recording contract. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and still score theatrically released films. And the movie was good. Yeah, oh, yeah that's a good he, point. He's a master, for sure. And that kind of brings me to the next one that I'd like to talk about, which uh, is If Beale Street Could Talk. So this is a film that uh, I didn't see, but I think I got a really good impression of it from the music. And I think that's because the music score is really, really good. I think it's communicating a lot of narrative. Um, one of the interesting things uh, that I found about it was this approach to uh, take jazz and give it this whole like ambient approach which to me kind of communicated the narrative of so I started to put a few things together just from the title of the film and the title of the tracks and the way the music seemed to be presented I don't know if this is what the film is about and I'd rather not know what the film is about before I go and see it because that's just the way I am but um, my impression is like the first track is called Harlem and the movie's called If Beale Street Could Talk, so I'm guessing Beale Street is a street in Harlem. Um, and then I'm, I'm hearing in this music almost the history of the sound of Harlem kind in of that echoing, music. Echoing, echoing up the walls. Like as if the bricks could talk. I mean, and it yeah. just literally says if Beale Street could talk, you know. So I don't know if that has anything to do with um, the direction on the score, but that was the impression I got that this music really would represent sort of the echoes of the history of Harlem and the and mm. the streets. And it also I remember there was there was a quality to it that was real frail, real fragile, and almost but also sort of like a dirge, like a a funeral dirge, and yet fragile. Yeah. So I'm not sure. Maybe it's possibly about the deaths of some people or uh, somebody is dying who's old and fragile I'm not sure but there was certainly really really good communication on the part of the composer um, narratively in the music to be able to communicate all these things uh, well um, it also had like a nursery rhyme quality to it so I don't know if you noticed that but it had this like nursery rhyme yeah, quality yeah I mean it was very yeah. bright shimmery I would say breathy as well my favorite track actually was Agape I, mm -hmm. I assume it's not agape, but I know I'm not sure. That's what I thought. I, I thought like, it was it agape. 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 Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm not the only one. That's weird. No, you're not the only one. <laughs> I, was... I called it agape in my mm -hmm. mind. <laughs> okay, but yeah, that was my favorite because it it was like, wait, did Terrence Blanchard do this one instead? And they just kind of swapped their names because right. it, it was the trumpet solo was kind of right. coming out, and they were aleatoric. First oh, the trumpet, yeah. and then the piccolo trumpet. Man, piccolo yeah. trumpet is Ooh. underutilized. That was such a nice sound. Yeah, that just put, yeah. took me all the way back yes. to the good band, the ugly. When yes. I was hearing that, it, in there. it was like a toy piano, but brass. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, kind of I got that like feeling through. from this that it was almost like a more of a modern take on like a, a soundtrack from maybe '60s, early early '70s, not later on. But mm -hmm. it did. It had. Uh, it was. It was. It did. It had almost this kind of ambient atmospheric quality, but it was still very up close and intimate. And I didn't get that feeling like I was, you know, drifting from something. I felt like I was always being kind of brought in. Yeah, um, a very and, small group. Yeah, exactly. Like, a very exact into a, it's a very small kind of just kind of closed um, sort of just area. And it just it really did it. Just it kind of uh, it really does kind of rope you in instead of kind of like it's just kind of you know maybe making you feel like you're a little more outside looking in. Right. So. What I thought was interesting, too, was like at one point he was doing this A minor thing and it's, it, I was like, whoa, it was kind of like had a Baroque quality, like, you know, like a, 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 a perhaps like one of these liturgical, like, I don't know, in, in the church, but it was that, it was like reminding me of that. So I wonder where that, how that got into there, but it was very, very kind of cool. Maybe it had something to do with it. You're totally right. That. I totally heard that. That dirge quality I was talking about yeah. had that. It was yeah. like, he has a couple of counterpoint lines that just are very traditional and it was it was it was amazing to see something so fresh done with such traditional you know counterpoint really really mm -hmm. was cool and also at times um it reminded me of the score to nocturnal animals did you guys listen to that score at all yeah. 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 Oh, where really it has this like repeating oh, yeah. fragile yeah quality uh that movie has to do with well i mean that's pretty deep so but there's uh, and I know if I say anything about nocturnal animals, I'll give it away. You know, spoil. So, if you haven't seen Nocturnal Animals, by the way, you see that movie. That's incredible. 
But, um, you know, like Philip Glass does with, like, Koyana Skotsky or any of his movies where, movie scores, where you have that repeating element. It just keeps, he's like, okay, it's that context thing we talked about, uh, like, about the thing, remember? Yes. It's like the atmosphere, you know, the, the context of this has to be always sort of present, omnipresent, right, always, because right. this story, I guess, takes place under these conditions, right? And so I think, you know, that's part of why he... He did a really good job, Nicholas Bertel, of mm. you know repeating that repeating. Is that the same guy that did the score to Moonlight, right? I'm not I believe sure. so, and that was the one that I think. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it did win the Best Picture the award. Best picture. <laughs> yeah, you know, it didn't, and then it did. You know, yeah. uh, so I still have to see that movie, but now I'm hooked. I mean, Nicholas Bertel did a really, really beautiful job on this score. I think I I really love it a lot. Now, my favorite track from If Beale Street Could Talk was uh, Miss Victoria Rogers, actually. Oh, yeah, I like that one. It had this moment with this really weird, wild vibrato. Right. That, to me, if you're familiar with Vaporwave, just kind of <laughs> brought in that aesthetic, like this false nostalgia is, is the idea. You know, and you have this clock rhythm, and then just this vibrato, there's a... Like, really, really wide yeah. to, to an effect. Yeah, it was great. Who's that? Who's that trumpet player? He was like around in this late seventies. He kind of uh, feels. I think it's feel good. Uh, oh, Chuck Mangione. Yeah, oh, that's, Chuck Mangione. that's what I thought when I was hearing the score. There was one yeah. part I was like, oh, Chuck Mangione. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Chuck Mangione is sound. really wonderful and um, probably highly, I don't know, underrated. Like they deliberately underrate him, you know, because it yeah. can be kind of elevator music mm-hmm. in a way. Right, right, right. But it's not. It's, oh, it, he's so really great. a fantastic composer. I love everything by Chuck Mangione. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Tenth Commandment. Um, what's that Spanish tinge song that oh, he always man. does? The dun da da dun da dun da dun da da dun da da dun da dun da 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 <laughs> yeah, that high flugelhorn sounds so hard to, to get. That uh, Brittel, in an interview on Film Music Media, says he worked uh, very closely with the director. The director asked for brass, huh. and also this is their second collaboration after Moonlight. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, let's a lot see. of comments. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> uh, Anthony Dressler on YouTube says this right now is legendary. <laughs> oh, love it. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, Gabe Martinez giving us some good, some good props. Nice. Very Thanks, cool. Gabe. Yes. Thanks, Gabe. <laughs> so um, the next score that I want to talk about. Well, the final well, score. Well, hold on. What is it? Before we talk Dallas. about that, do you guys have any? <laughs> what about like honorable mentions? Honorable like, mentions. scores that should have been oh, here oh, but never made oh, it. Man. Well, sure. Let me. Let's go over the last one and then let's go there and then let's pick. Our favorite right. to win. How's okay. that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I don't. I don't run award shows. So I don't know the order. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Don't hire me. Don't make me. A, so now we Oscars. get to um, Black Capan. No, just kidding. It's Black <laughs> Panther. Black Panther. <laughs> Black Panther. No. Uh, yeah, Black Panther, and uh, it's by um, this guy. I think who came out of the DJ world or something. Is that right? Uh, Kyle, what's his name again? Ludwig, <laughs> Ludwig Göransson? Or yeah, something? Ludwig uh, Göransson, yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I heard that he did a lot of research on the score and went into the field. I think I don't know if that's true. If he went to, I believe, Africa and he recorded <laughs> things authentically over in Africa yeah. and uh, then uh, incorporated it into the score. I think the score was is, is monumental in its, like achievement of production quality oh, it's, yeah. it's got just I don't know how many tracks there it possibly it could be a thousand tracks there's, I see it. Yeah. there's so yeah. so much work went into this score and um, he's got you know African uh, instruments playing African uh, tribal type of uh, drummings and chantings yeah. over on top of a massive full blockbuster sized orchestra <laughs> which is probably 150 to 200 pieces when you include the choir big choir <laughs> so massive and it probably was a very big team so there was a lot of work that went into it but but in the end I felt that it was pretty much just a straightforward treatment of how you would just score a movie you know it's got this 
quality where you want to bring elements in from Africa, and so he did, and um, mm. those were straightforward, and then you have the heroics, uh, the heroic material, which is this three-note motif, which then he modulates, you know, up a fourth or a third, I think, and uh, it's not even extended. It's not even an extended melody. It's just a three-note motif that that repeats again, and then he uses that in different forms, and it keeps getting uplifting and uplifting and more uplifting, and then he cuts off as this constant build to the cliffhanger and end, and he keeps using the same formulaic structure like that over and over for every cue, and he keeps building, and then it brings in the little heroic element, and dun 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 and then vroom. And now we're back into the next scene, and it's just, uh, I think that uh, for me, it was nothing revolutionary, um, except for the fact that I think that uh, it was extremely well done as far as production quality goes. Yeah. I just don't know about, as a composer, if I could give, um, is Ludwig is his name? Did you yeah, look that Ludwig, count? yes. Yeah, if I, could, if, if I could give Ludwig uh, full props on this, say, like the Academy Award, but... Certainly, it's no fan certainly, <laughs> but certainly it's uh, certainly it's probably a great score, a hell of a soundtrack, really exciting, um, which you could say about like, you know, any Marvel movie. I just you know not quite sure if I would give it Academy Award status. I think there's a certain by the numbers. You even mentioned to kind of approach when it comes to these to these Marvel movies nowadays, where they'll they'll try to fit in themes that are essential just to that character. But overall, they're they're still trying to convey this very big, very like three note heroic kind of thing. No matter what it is, whether you're Thor or Captain America or you know or uh, Black Panther. But I think uh, the same regard. I think Black Panther, obviously, he's a much different character. He comes from a whole different world from these guys. Even you know, he's like as opposed to like Thor. Um, and I I do I think kind of the same regard where it was it was a great mixture of trying to add these African instruments into this kind of mix but even what, like what, what Evan mentioned previously where it's like African instruments playing already African music it's kind of like there isn't too much you can do with that there isn't, you really can't go outside the box with that you know and uh, groundbreaking I wouldn't call it that but still in the same regard like when it does fit because I did see the film when it does fit with the film it does fit very well it's it, oh, yeah. they re- you could tell they really paid a lot of attention to that type of aspect and you're getting those big dramatic moments you're getting that feeling oh we're back in uh, Wakanda you know we're back at there you know okay we're back you know so all these different cues and such, you, they really put a lot of time and effort into that, and you can absolutely hear it, especially with just the size of yeah. the production itself, the orchestra. Craftsmanship-wise, stellar, not ten point oh. Yeah. It, it, it's what you expect when you go to see a Marvel film. I feel yeah. like that in a lot of regards. Yeah. It's, it's like it's like the Weta workshops of music. Yes, <laughs> right. you know they they yeah. have the money and they you know they're just going to make something fantastic. It might not be memorable, but it's it's going to be top notch. It's going to fit. I like the talking yeah. drums, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Do, 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 yeah, do, go, 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 go. Yeah, great. Right. Yes. That's also present on one of my favorite jazz albums, uh, Taranga by John Faddis. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a very, you know, beloved sound. I think that's cool. You know, I, I don't know if you guys watch Chopped, but one of the biggest criticisms that chefs get, Chopped is a Food Network channel where they're given four special ingredients and they have to make dishes. Yeah. One of the biggest yeah. criticisms the contestants get is that they didn't incorporate the new ingredients into the dish that they just kind of put it on top. Just put it on there, yeah. And I felt like mm. with a lot of the African stuff, that's what it was. It was like, all right, we're going to you know, pan the camera over in pure you know, African ethnic drum grooves and then pan back to orchestra. Mm. And I didn't feel like the two elements, even if they were superimposed, they didn't really interact in a way that felt like the material had been digested and then analyzed and then synthesized. Mm-hmm. You know, it just felt very raw at, mm-hmm. the, at the moment. And I mm-hmm. think if there had been a little more compositional stewing going yeah. on, we would have had something better. I but, think, you know, it's tough for us because we're composers. And so probably to 99% of the world, this score was as phenomenal as Mary Poppins. You know, it was balls to the wall, top to bottom, left to right. You know, every note on the score written just like fantastically. And uh, But, you know... For us as composers, it was kind of a pat presentation. It was really, it's nothing new. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's very similar to Mary Poppins because it's it's well done, but it's just, it's, you know, it is what it is. Um, I did like the, the low digital beats that they had going on, the kind of blasty low synths. Mm-hmm. I thought the variety of sounds were great. Yeah, it was, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but just uh, combining them, it, it they didn't feel necessarily cohesive. I feel yeah. Mm. I felt the same way. I feel like they like wrote the, all those like you know say like the more like tribal aspects and the more like they wrote them completely separate, and then yeah. exactly they were just like 
Shotgun. Okay, there you go. You know, let's, <laughs> yeah, I'll just merge them in. Don't you know? Don't have this lead into this. You know, which which they could have very well done. Like, could you, you know? could you imagine having like a talking drum rhythm? You know, like some kind of because there's some really cool like six eight grooves oh, going yeah. on, oh, and then yeah. the drums like turn into a digital sound. Exactly. Just like yeah. with as much money as they had, they could have a drum sound that becomes a digital synth beat sort of and keeps like, going. Right. You know, oh, you know how they fly through the force fields. You yeah. Could imagine that with music. That would, like there's so much creativity they could have done with. Yeah. that huge palette but to me it, it like paint by numbers it was like a sing, single color and then a single color exactly. not much blending not much nuance shaping very mm-hmm. true very I think true. one thing that's that's for sure is this year we have a lot of variety of types of composers yes right. you yeah. know and, very true you know maybe you know maybe the John Williams and Ennio Morricone aren't in there you know <laughs> and so we've got a, a very interesting mix of of mm of styles of and approaches and composers and thinking and ideating and uh, I think if anything that's exciting so moving forward you know there's quite a bit of, of talent there some young some new and fresh and uh, it's going to be interesting to see where they go for the next 50 years right yeah so along that line I wonder which is your favorite each of yours except first let's talk for a moment about uh, what are there any scores this year in the la- in the past year? Any movies which had some scores which you thought uh, you know ought to be up there? Ooh. Oh man, I have to I have to think about this one for. At I least probably should ask you guys beforehand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's good. I like but if you have a few, it's great. Go for yeah. it. Uh, well, I've got to think of some myself as well. Yeah, I mean, I think Avengers: Infinity War was a really great movie. Oh yeah, and I think that when that happens to me, when I enjoy a movie uh, at that level, which I thought I, I thought Avengers: Infinity War was a much better movie than even yeah. uh, Black Panther. Oh, what about Solo? And Solo, they my got, God! They, well, I think it got like uh, disqualified. Well, they forgot to. No, they forgot uh, to submit it. I remember hearing that. Yeah. Oh no! <laughs> it's been intense. Uh, crap. John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was actually a really fun one. Um, you need year. to hire Dallas as your assistant there, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, actually, now that I think about it, Solo was really interesting. Um, John Powell has a really different approach to large orchestra, but not any less busy or intricate than John Williams. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, he, he, he has a really, um, I think he's bright, whereas John Williams can get dark. Mm-hmm. And so to hear Solo, you know, he put so much heart into that score. Um, it really shows, and he ma- he managed to use the old material well, and he had a new material, and he blended it together. I felt the same way. I'm, that was a really fun one. Such a huge fan, obviously, huge Star Wars fan. I felt kind of the same way. It was a great, even much like better odes and nods to some of the previous work that John Williams did, as say maybe compared to like um, Rogue One, or uh, Rogue One, or the uh, the. F- um, I think episode seven, the name is escaping me right now. Uh, Force Awakens. Yes, Force Awakens. When that came out, when that when that first trailer came out. And they were using the uh, um, a reprise, and it was a much more downplayed version. But it was from *Empire Strikes Back*, that theme that plays kind of with Han and Leia when they're in the Millennium Falcon and they're escaping from the uh, the Tie Fighters, the I think some meteor, and they get the giant worm thing. But <laughs> that like yeah. that is probably one of my favorite pieces of music that he ever wrote for that series because it's yeah. just so intimate, it's so close, it encapsulates the sci-fi story with this kind of love story now and all these elements. And I thought it was going to be a big part of The Force Awakens, and it wasn't. And I remember being in the theater being like, when is that going to come up? Like, mm-hmm. And right. they very, very subtly played it, and they kind of just cut it. Mm-hmm. But I feel like Solo did a much better job of that, of kind of doing yeah. these these old reprises, but then at the same time adding so much more to them. Yeah, I, I, you know? there, there are two standout um, moments in the score for me. One was the Emphasis Nest cue, which had this strange, you know, Eastern European female yeah. choir. Yes. Which was just awesome. Yeah. Um, it, it almost sounds like the uh, the Japanese choir for Ghost in the Shell. Yeah. It's like, eh, oh, nice. very nasal. Yeah. That was a really cool sound, and really to hear it in Star Wars yeah. uh, felt very natural. I think he could have pushed that even further. He could have made it more really? biting, more dissonant, um, and kind of weird. There's a lot of weird music yeah. in Star Wars. And then the other moment was the uh, the added like synth drums, kind of heavy drums during the train sequence, Yes, which would normally be no. just a regular, you know, play it by ear, um, you, you know, chase music, Hollywood style. And he has his massive drums on the bottom of it, 
It actually worked really well. Yes. And they had the Bulgarian yeah. choir on it top. Right, that, yeah, uh, the choir was coming in and out as the, right. uh, the speeder bike was flying in. Yeah, that was incredible. Yeah, that's a real shame that that wasn't nominated. It is. Because, yeah. frankly, I think it would have made it this far. Yeah. 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 It's, it's definitely br bright as well. It, it checks all the boxes for what I think um, allowed these five scores to make it. Yeah. So now I don't know if I uh, really have figured out which one is my favorite score, but I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> now when I compare all these, I basically think that I'm going to choose, yes, if Beale Street could talk. So that's my vote for that. If Beale Street could talk, I think, was the best score of the year. I think it used the medium of music to communicate narrative in a way that's worthy of an Academy Award. I think it did an excellent job of doing so. And how about you, Dallas? Um, like I said, Isle of Dogs was my favorite. Really? <laughs> um, it, it was It was rock solid and perfectly fitted to the film. And I think giving it best score will send a message that there's not some universal, objective, better way to do a score that, you know, you have all these tools at your disposal and you can go down all these different paths. And the best path is what's dictated by art and great taste. Mm -hmm. And I think I Love Dogs um, was, was that one for me. For me, it was kind of like a toss-up between I Love Dogs and If Beale Street Could Talk. And I think... Um, I just think, for me, it was If Beale Street Could Talk. I think that was, had a slight edge uh, in the fact that uh, it was just... For me, it was more of like the story. It told the story maybe a little better. Uh, although, it, it was pretty damn close between those two for me. And I like the narrative choices in Beale Street Could Talk from a, maybe a more compositional... Maybe that's a style that I feel more drawn to as opposed to Isle of Dogs. More... That maybe sort of went to went a little more abstract. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that maybe tried to be something a little more cutting edge. I think maybe that went over Beale Street Could Talk in terms yeah. of cutting edge, I think. But I don't know. Yeah, so nice. <laughs> that's my verdict. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, I'm probably going to go with, uh, I think, Isle of Dogs as well. It's because I, I, I like when you can hear something that really does kind of stand out. I mean, I'm a little biased. I do enjoy Wes Anderson's approach and filmmaking, but I like the fact that you can also tell he does have a lot of influence. You can just hear it in his soundtracks. They're all different, but he does really bring forth this almost melancholy quality, but he brings it into this way where it paints it very beautifully, and I kind of got that with the soundtrack. I also got like some differences where like almost like a very oppressive, like militaristic style with the drums and the chanting and this kind of, you know, the society where they've shunned all these dogs, quarantined them to this island, and you kind of get this feeling like, you know, you are kind of this kid where you're like, well, I know my dog's sick, but he's, he's on his island, but I, I want my dog back. You know, it, 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 it fit, like, like what Dallas said, it just fit the movie very well. And I think when you have that, you, you get that kind of that um, masterpiece in a way. I haven't seen the film yet. Um, I really want to, but... It's again, a, it's it, a hard one to see. Yeah. It's it's, limited release. It was, well, it was a release. Oh, yeah, that made, okay. Well, that's, yeah, that makes sense now. Um, but uh, <gasps> but no, it, it, it from what I can, from what I heard from the soundtrack, it flowed very well, and it gave me that feeling too, where it painted the scenes for me, and even without seeing it, I could still kind of get the intro. I got the middle. I got the. I kind of, I could, I could kind of put together almost my own sort of version of that story. So yeah. But, yeah. So there you have it. It seems like <laughs> we have a semi semi split vote, but yeah, maybe point five leaning towards. Uh, Isle of Dogs for Andrew Desplat, but uh, uh, Alexandra Desplat, but uh, he's not even going to be able to sh to come to the Academy Awards, and oh, that's a shame. and I think he may have won our little vote, our little <laughs> vote here. Yeah, We're sending those vibes yeah, to him. Way to go, Alexandra! I think maybe yes. you should get on a plane. I think this might be a really close call, um, but yeah, I think if we went with our final decisions, we have kind of a split vote between if Beale Street could talk, mm -hmm. and uh, I, by Nicholas Brutel. Good luck tomorrow, and uh, Isle of Dogs, Alexander Desplat. Good luck, everyone, all of the composers. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. it's going to be a very interesting show, and I look forward to seeing who, who takes home the Oscar. Yes. Thanks for tuning in, everyone, and see you next all week. Right. Thanks, guys.